kind of, I'm not going to talk about the internals and stuff like that like you've heard in uh, other Cassandra talks. Hold on, let me get the timer started. Too long. Um, we're in a particular position at DIG that's kind of interesting in that uh, we have Cassandra in production and maybe sort of nobody else does, no one's sure. Facebook's got a flavor of Cassandra, but if you kind of ask anybody, it's the project's forked out and all this stuff now. So kind of a different situation. So I'm going to kind of focus the talk on what's it been like from a practical perspective on having something out there that's pre-alpha, no one really knows it, and specifically, I'll get to this later, is none of the rest of the developers at your company know. So DIG's kind of a medium-ish organization, about 17, 18 developers and stuff like that. So it's not you and your four buddies in a garage. So it kind of throws a wrench and stuff and makes things a little bit more interesting. So this is me. Uh, if you guys get the Cheech and Chong joke, that's good. Uh, I'm Aaron, uh, core infrastructure team at DIG. You can reach me uh, email. My screen name's Fat Duck on just about everything on the internet. Um, what else? OK, so DIG, uh, a lot of this audience probably knows what it is. We do a lot of uh, uniques a month. And up until now, DIG's been pretty much the standard LAMP architecture. I like to kind of joke and call it the what would LiveJournal do architecture, right? Just switch the P for PHP instead of Perl. So um, we're using essentially a lot of Danga type stuff there. And we got to this spot now where there's a lot of pains associated with like the standard kind of like memcache, MySQL, blah, 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 blah. And we're looking for alternatives to see what we could do. So one of the things we did first before we got into kind of doing a new architecture in Cassandra was, you know, we started sharding just like everyone else does. Uh, and at a certain point, you just start realizing it's a pain in the ass, right? There's no standard way to do it. So you, we ended up with, you know, vertical partitioning is easy, right? You just pretend you're in the silo, don't join against anything, just leave it alone and select star from some table and call it a day, right? Then we kind of homebrewed this thing called IDDB for horizontal partitioning where things get tricky, right? And this is where kind of some of the systems you see now, when they talk about stuff like hinted handoff and bootstrapping and all this, so being a PHP shop up until recently, I guess, that gets a little dirty, right? Because all this stuff's in PHP and it's not very good at much besides templating, right? So you got this crazy stuff you're trying to do and it's just not cutting it and other various things like you know DB upgrade scripts and keeping track of which server has what and in your client you have to know what IPs to talk to for what. Just a big mess, right? And then after all that you've horizontally partitioned the shit out of your stuff and you got vertical partitioning and now you've thrown away the R from relational database, right? So you do that and you're like, okay, well I don't got joins, I'm doing like you know primary key lookups on this thing that's built to do all these ad hoc queries. So why not just think of other stuff, right? So, some, so if you kind of go from that point, and you're like, okay, I've thrown away the whole join thing and all these cool things or whatever, and doing primary key lookups and getting slices of data is kind of what we really want to do anyways. Let's just look at all the, all the alt alternatives. So this was months ago, and uh, we looked at a couple projects, and to be honest, like, it was so quick that we didn't dive in horribly deep into anything. There was like HBase that sounded interesting, but this was before the point two release. And we finally discovered Cassandra and started kind of talking about it internally, getting on the IRC channel and stuff. And um, that's kind of how we got there. But we wanted something that was open source as well, right? So we're doing this homebrew thing, and it's like specific to how Dig do things. So we have problems, and it'd be nice if there's other people working on the same problems. It's just not these three people's solutions, because maybe they're smoking crack and they're wrong. Whatever, right? Open source is just better, because you get a lot of other people contributing it. So you get various perspectives on the same problem, as well as the fact that you know there's other people writing code that you get for free, right? That's just kind of obvious. And then uh, management was really good at encouraging it. Rather, they, they were like, yeah, just think out of the box. Like, whatever is going to work, just give it a shot. And I know that's kind of an advantage we have over some other places, right? Like, so if you're a bank or something, tell them you're using this, checking out this database that's like 0.03 alpha, there's one contributor, and like, it's eventually consistent, and yeah, it's blah, blah, blah. It's not going to buy it. But I mean, it's dig, right? So it's a social networking thing. You know, worst case scenario, we lose your dig. Like, what's going to happen, right? Like, it's not, there's no real world implications. It's just a standard website. It's going to, no one's going to die, right? It's not medical stuff. So, um, and easier administration is a big deal, right? So, talking about like, during the last presentation, right, you take just, you just take a machine out of the cluster, like the gossip protocols, 
all that stuff, you're kind of getting closer and closer to what a while ago you just sit there and say, oh, you want this dream system. Like, oh, I just add a node and it just works. Right? So we're getting closer to these things coming to fruition with all these new projects that we're all here talking about representing or whatnot, right? So this uh, kind of hinted at this uh, in the last one, but you know, Cassandra we picked based on the easier, uh, the promise of easy administration. We started a little while ago around 0.3, so you know things have definitely gotten better. And Jonathan's like smiling over there, and like um, you know now there's bootstrap, so you can bring a new node on, and like it gets you know, uh, some portion of the cluster or the ring belongs to him, and you know, they get they start slowly start getting the data from the other nodes and. Hey, it's there. That's awesome. There's no single point of failure, and it's a little bit more. It's more flexible than the key value store thing, right? So it's not just like you put in something and you pull it out. So we got it has you know the notion of you know the column families where a row can have an infinite number of columns. They don't have to match. So it's not quite schemaless, but it's not quite just a key value store. So all that was good. The community was growing, which was a big deal, right? So it's just like anecdotal stuff. Like all these technologies were pretty new up until like still are pretty new, right? But up to six months ago, there's less and less talk about them. But now things are getting, you know, pretty good. You'll see people talking about them. So anecdotal evidence, you know, you just, you know, the Twitter guys are talking to us about, oh, you guys are thinking about Cassandra too? Let's talk about it. We met the Rackspace guys, we met the IBM guys. The IRC channel gets more and more people a day. The mailing list gets more. So it starts building confidence that, you know, maybe this isn't just something that's like Facebook's bastard project that they threw away and people are picking up, right? It's a legitimate project. And it's gaining, you know, getting a community around it, and it's pretty good. And the last comment is, you know, I don't want to start a language war, but it's Java, which to me was interest was a selling point, just because, you know, the couple of the people, well, one of it's practical. Three out of four people in the team were comfortable with Java, so it's not C++ where some guys like uh, scared of it and Erlang, which is crazy or whatever, right? So it's Java, and you can just plug it into, plug it into IntelliJ, press a, you know, put a breakpoint throw requests at it, and just trace the damn thing to the end and see what happens. So that was just easy for us for the adoption. And uh, another thing was one of the uh, you know, th features that existed at the time, which has always existed as far as I know, we saw hinted handoff work right off the bat. Right? We had two laptops together, and that was the cluster. I, you know, We'd have both laptops on, do a write, pull one of them out, and we'd just tail the logs and see what happens. So just seeing that something that you know, was you know, magic was working right off the bat on, with an hour's worth of work of just like, you know, setting up a machine or whatever. So that was pretty awesome. So we started investigating these technologies, and Cassandra became our front runner. And we're like playing with it internally, trying to figure out what can you do, trying to understand some of the stuff, you know, getting in touch with people, educating ourselves. But at the same time, we needed a proof of concept, right? So we have to see, what is this thing going to do in production? It's pretty awesome that my laptop and Chris's hinted half handoff works, but you know, whatever. Those are two Macs, no big deal. That's nothing like production. So we need a proof of concept, right? We need to see, what does this thing do with uh, production levels of you know, requests and stuff like that? And what's it going to be like for ops to manage a cluster of, I think we started off at 12, 12 of these guys. So what's going to happen? And um, another facet of the whole thing is that, you know, looking at a bunch of these things, denormalization gets thrown around a lot, right? So we're like, okay, so let's pick a data set that we can denormalize more than we need to just to see what this world is going to look like, right? So we picked this feature to do called green badges. I don't know if my shadow can point at it. So it's that little arrow up there. So if you're logged into Dig and you, you're on the home page or whatever, you'll see that little green badge, which means one of your friends has dug this story, right? So over the years, this feature started getting slower and slower and slower because of all the, it's, there's a ton of data in Dig, like all the like the Dig's table's big and all that stuff, right? So uh, it's actually we have so the we have switches that turn this feature off during high load times and other stuff like that. So it fit the bill. So we got a lot of crap on this when we talked about it, uh, and then it got put on Reddit. But you know you could solve this problem a million ways. But the reason we picked this feature to solve a specific way is to Proof of concept. Is Cassandra going to stand up? What's it going to be like for us to manage a lot of denormalized data? And it's a feature we don't really give a shit about, right? Like it's that stupid little green thing, right? So we break it, big deal, right? And it's considering there's already switches in the app to turn it off. So there it is. We need to know which one of your friends have dug a story. So we denormalized it to hell, which I'll show you in a second. 
But then given the properties of Cassandra, getting all the data is no longer fancy query magic or any query magic at all. It's pretty easy. So if you kind of know anything about Cassandra, there's this column family thing. So we used a super column approach here. So the row ID, would, would row key would be the story ID here, one, two, three, four, five. And the super columns would be named after you, the user ID. And we'd insert a column for each one of your friends that dug it. So on the app, whenever somebody digs this, we insert into MySQL just to make sure we don't you know, ruin anything, right? Because this is our proof of concept, right? But then we fire off a Gearman job that would go ahead and populate the stuff in the background in Cassandra. So we sat there doing this for a while. So it's writing to MySQL and asynchronously through Gearman, we're populating Cassandra and we got this cluster going starting to collect data. And this was kind of what we called you know, our dark lunch. So we modified the app to have switches for this green badge thing. So the two switches were uh, right to Cassandra, which is on to this day. And the other one was whether you're reading from Cassandra or MySQL. And the other one was, well, essentially you decide if you're reading or writing from MySQL and Cassandra, right? So that was our dark launch. So we flipped the right to Cassandra launch on. So we're writing to MySQL and Cassandra, so we're not losing any data and all that. And then we just started monitoring the machines, see what's going on. And we had a test machine, a, te a, a web server that had these uh, switches both flipped to Cassandra, right? Um, that we would use and test and see what's going on, some internal IP that no one else could get to, and just to see how things go. And so how did things go? They were okay. So it's, this kind of might sound disastrous, but there's, it's, it wasn't that bad at all. So, I mean, this is probably the first time anyone really put into production. I don't know. I don't want to claim we're first because that's just egotistical. But, you know, things happened. There was race conditions. There was deadlocks and all this stuff. Ta SS tables were corrupted and all this stuff. But this is why we're doing a proof of concept, right? Somebody has to do this. So we did all this and, you know, it worked, but then things went wrong. You know, it's just like anything else you do. So it might sound disastrous, and some like anti NoSQL guy would be like, oh, see that piece of shit, you got corruptions, but MySQL gets corrupted all the time and it dies, and it's kind of a non issue, but people talk about it. So things happen, but it's okay. We've got three people, two and a half, because I count myself as half, on the team that contribute to the t uh, project. I've submitted a couple trivial patches, but we've got Chris Goffinet and Sammy Yu that are you know, regular con uh, contributors, and Chris is, pro I think, now a, an official committer to the project. So throughout this time when we were investigating before we did this, we'd gotten involved in the community, we'd been doing patches, even I was doing some stuff just to see the internals and make sure, you know, I can talk to people like you about this shit, right? So we did that, and we have the internal capability of fixing some of these problems that come up. So, and besides that, you know, we had talked to Jonathan earlier. We brought him in for about a week to consult at DIG. So we were in a pretty good shape to get ourselves to a place where we can tackle the uncertainties that this thing may, may bring us, right? So it's not that everything's going to be perfect, but we want to be prepared that if we made the call to go with Cassandra, we had the in-house ability to deal with this. It's a young project, 0.5 is not out yet, that's a big deal, and I'd encourage anyone to re that's considering using it in like, production or real environment, is make sure you have some guys in-house that can dig into it, not just to fix it, but just so when you report a bug, you can intelligently talk about what's going on and help guide everyone else that's actually gonna be running uh, to help solve the issues for you. So being in the community definitely helped. Uh, being friends with uh, you know, the Rackspace guys at that point, and IBM guys, and all that stuff is definitely good, being involved with all these people. So what we did is we finally, so the green badge, whoa. So the green badge data, we really only cared about the first couple months worth of data, right? So we were live filling for a, couple, for a few weeks there, and then you know, we'd have to backfill everything else. Not completely necessarily the most important things. We don't care what, you know, if your friend dug that story from two years ago, but that br brings forth another exercise that's worth doing if we're going to migrate from MySQL to that. So that was uh, the binary mem, mem table thing. So this is essentially a backdoor way where you can shove in pre-serialized data into Cassandra. Um, so we got, so it goes, we dump MySQL data to Hadoop, and uh, from Hadoop we can use the binary mem table access and get the stuff into Cassandra and put a lot of the tax on Hadoop cluster instead of the cluster that's running. So eventually, we had this 12-node cluster of about, about three terabytes of data. 
and it ended up being too much, and we cut, cut down the thing. But throughout this process, we'd also uh, kill servers just to see what happens, right? I mean, this is a proof of concept. That's what we're doing this for, right? It's not just to see, hey, it's fast. I mean, it's plenty fast, sure, but what happens when things break? Ops wants to know this stuff, right? So we'd f flip all these things, and finally we got it to a point where things were pretty stable, and we flipped, it, uh, flipped all the web servers to read from Cassandra, and that's how it's been ever since. It's been a couple months now, and things are mostly good. We've had a couple nodes get a little mad, but nothing that wasn't easily taken care of. And again, uh, that's a lot of the fact that we had guys contributing to the project makes diagnosing those problems you know, way better, and you have the potential to fix them yourself. But at least the diagnosis is key, right? So we blogged about it, and we got a lot of crap from the rest of the people on the internet, because they didn't understand what we were doing, right? They had no idea that, yeah, we know this is kind of overkill to solve this one little problem. But the business goal is, hey, is this new database thingy, I don't want to call it just a database because it's loaded, but is this going to work for us in production? And our answer after all this was yes. So it's running fine, everything's good, and we're seeing as good performance, which you know, isn't saying much because the site's getting a little slow nowadays, uh, but we're not using memcache at all. So before we got the performance of the slow MySQL stuff plus memcache, we essentially have a negligible difference from using Cassandra all the time with no caching. So that was pretty encouraging. So what are we gonna do now? Like, hey, this looks good, we like it. So let's port the rest of, the dig, to, of dig to Cassandra. And yet, we're really going to do the entire app in Cassandra. So some of the stuff, so Cassandra's got tunable parameters for consistency, and that was mentioned a little bit ago uh, in the last presentation. But it turns out when you have like master, master, MySQLs on different data sets, the way replication on Cassandra works and the rack awareness and stuff like that with the quorum read-write tunings that you can do during request times, you can actually get it to be, you know, pretty consistent. So even parts where you'd think like, hey, is this username taken? We're highly considering putting that in Cassandra as well. If we did that in MySQL on two data centers, right, we'd have to either pick one of them to be the canonical you know, username database, you know, so other games like that. So we're going to put everything in Cassandra, and we're prototyping this now. So the other couple problems you get now are, OK, so we did it with this kind of relatively lame kind of feature with a green badge thingy, right? But now we need real data from the site. So we don't want to constantly do this binary mem table thing, because that's kind of slowish, and it's not the fastest way. It's great for backfills, but it's not the best thing to be doing on a real-time basis. And our VP of engineering was like, hey, let's get stuff that's happening on the live site over to the test cluster in real time. And we're like, OK. So let's figure that out. So we need real-time data, and we need real time. Someone say something? I thought I heard something. All right. So we need real-time data. Uh, from the site, and we also need real time or real traffic to see what's going to happen. So, so far we've got a prototype of Dig working on Cassandra, and it's not the entire site, right? We actually don't have users and stuff like that. So, everything is being, we don't have user accounts on there, so you can't really log in and stuff. But as far as looking at the Apple page, the politics page, or the front page, we've got that going. So, it's pretty good. And we'll get all the other stuff there. And it's going to take a little while for us to get there. But we're pretty certain at this point that we can pull it off and that we're going to be happy with it. And obviously, we're going to learn a lot of lessons along this way. So people are going to ask us for you know, numbers and stuff like that. So during this transition, before we're done, is when we'll be best equipped. I can tell you numbers now, but they're kind of meaningless considering the small feature set we ported to Cassandra right now. So during this transition, we'll have some pretty good data that hopefully the community will find really useful. So I'm going to kind of shift a little bit on kind of what we did to enable ourselves, as opposed to just talking about Cassandra specifically. So we've got an ability now to get live data uh, to the dig site. Which slide is this? Live data, sure. So live data. So the live data we care about right now are the digs and the submissions, right? So every story getting submitted to the site and every single dig performed on that. We're kind of ignoring berries for now because Whatever, this is more important, right? So on the, si on the dig site, so it's a LAMP-based thing, and we use uh, uh, Gearman and all the stuff, so we can asynchronously do a bunch of stuff. One of the things we've been doing as of late is use Scribe for our logging needs. So the Scribe's another project by, I think, Facebook as well. So um, essentially, it's a great way to log stuff to a central place. 
So we'll JSON encode any story that's submitted or the dig objects when they're getting shoved into the database. Because we have the OR la our ORM layer, so we got an easy place to kind of put that in there. So these things get logged out. And then scribe gets the thing, and we have this thing that sips off the scribe log. So anytime something new gets thrown into the scribe log, we grab that line of JSON, deserialize it, and run it through the same submission or dig process through the test cluster. So it, we have, you know, milliseconds delay of getting your, if you submit a story on the live site, it comes to the test cluster. So we're kind of simulating a little bit of traffic, but obviously not all our traffic is digs and submissions. But we needed a way to see how this is going to work. So we have a small test cluster, and how much load can this take? So this is just an investigation thing. We don't have an exact answer of how big our architecture is going to need to be to support this. But uh, we, get, we pipe the Apache logs to something we call, we call the, the request tool. I don't, it doesn't really have a name. So whenever uh, a log line is you know, thrown through Apache from a custom log, right, we pipe it through a script that reads the timestamps and the URL, and it'll essentially hit the test cluster with the same URL. So any, and if it's some weird URLs, like fav icons or whatever, we'll still hit the test cluster, but not a fav icon URL. We'll just hit the home page or something like that. So it's a little bit more traffic than the actual site, right? So st even static file requests will make Cassandra fetches on and stuff like that. We also have a replay tool. So given a set of logs from the past, we can get, grab a chunk of those, analyze the timestamps, and try to emulate the requests in the same time frame. So we have a Python version of this that's pretty good. It can start lagging behind. And what it'll do, it'll tell you, like, hey, I'm starting to fall behind the timestamps. So increase the number of workers or threads or something like that. And then uh, pretty recently, Chris wrote an Erlang version, too, that can just kind of do everything. So we've got a way of getting the data to the test cluster, which is pretty important because we, uh, it's kind of annoying to sit there and fake a bunch of dig stories, right? It's going to suck. And we have a way of hitting the cluster with live, UR, uh, live traffic and also to replay traffic. The replay traffic, uh, we can have a factor on it, too. So we can you know, say, hey, one request came in. But yeah, just hit it with two instead. So we can try to see how far we can take this. So it's pretty good. It's not an exact science trying to replicate that stuff. But it's easily better than nothing. And it's pretty damn close to being true. So these are the tools that we found super useful. So. We've gotten to this point where we've got Cassandra working on kind of the bare bones of dig, right? So you get stories, the page shows up, you got digs, it's great, you have a number, you can dig the story on the test cluster as well. Always digs as Kevin Rose on the test, because we have no user accounts. But it's kind of sort of working, and we see what's going on. And a lot of this is an exercise for us, not in quite the performance of all this, is the mental shift. We have a team of 17 people, right? But we have a core infrastructure team of four. So this is kind of where things get weird, right? So you don't even have just technical problems, right? But you have to deal with these guys. So this is really people that work at Dig, and they don't read high scalability every day, and they you know, don't read you know, Dynamo papers for fun. Like, there's a lot of people that are just regular engineers, right? They're good at their jobs, but they're not going to go fly to Atlanta to hear about databases, right? So this is another thing that you, it's like a practical thing that comes up, right? You have all these people that just have lived in a relational world, and they don't understand what's going on when you tell them stuff. They come up and they're like, what the fuck is a super column? Right? Like, it's just really, what is it? I mean, it's like, it took, that was one definite thing, was like sitting there at the time we were looking into this, uh, these alternative technologies, right? Um, when we discovered Cassandra, we're like, this is pretty sweet, and Avinash had that little video thing that, you know, the slides made close to no sense at a certain time, and the pictures sucked, and all this stuff. And you're trying to understand, like, what is a column, super column? Things are drawn. It's like this three-dimensional. He picked ugly colors. It was a mess. So you're trying to understand what's going on. It took us a while of a bunch of us talking to each other and eventually meeting other people in the community, at which, at that point, there was like five other people, right? And figuring out what is going on. So they want to know, what, what is this? What is this data model? They just like tables that you, know, you open MySQL admin GUI, and it looks like Excel, and you can click on a cell and edit shit, right? But you can't do that anymore. Those days are gone, right? And then um, how do I query it? Well, you, know, you use Thrift. What the fuck is Thrift, right? Like, so like, there's one thing after another after another. Can I sort, well, once, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> and all this stuff. So I don't know if you guys know about Cassandra, but you pick your sorting 
on a per column family basis. And, that, and it, I don't know what happens if you change it. I haven't had the balls to try to change it after there's data in there, but I assume it breaks pretty badly. So th that's how it is. And then, you know, coming back to like the first uh, uh, slide here, which was like, you know, the title of the talk, uh, you know, you have just add an index. Yeah, but you got to manage them now, right? You don't get to go to some a console and say, hey, add an index. No, you got to start managing secondary indexes yourself. And it kind of becomes this new art, a new way of thinking how to do this. I know we're talking about lunch, and someone's asking, so how are you modeling the data? Which is a talk in and of itself, but uh, if anyone has questions about that, feel free to ping me later, because it's just a big discussion, right? Um, so yeah, so that you have to get all these other people on board. So what, so what do you do? You start writing, doing internal training sessions, right? So we have, you know, I wrote that PDF, I don't know who here read it, called What the Fuck is a Col Super Column, right? So stuff like that. It started off as, you know, the community needed it. Part of it was egged on by the Twitter guys wanting to change what everything was called. But then, you know, my team needed all this uh, information as well. They're going to need to do this, and I don't want to answer every single data model question for till I die, right? So there was that, a lot of internal training, documentation, examples, like, hey, this flavor of problem, here's a whole example of what the data model would look like and all this other stuff, right? And then we created this thing called Lazy Boy. It's a Python package that's on GitHub, actually, so just Google GitHub Lazy Boy, you'll find it. It's an abstract, it's a client for uh, uh, Cassandra, of course. And it kind of has like an ORM-y kind of idea to it, but it also supports these things called views that help manage secondary indexes. And uh, a little bit of the sharding that you have to do. So you st we still are kind of going to shard within Cassandra, so sharding's not gone forever, because there's uh, various problems with that. Uh, and then, OK, so you got a LAMP shop right now. That's awesome, cool. You're doing PHP, all this stuff. And now you got this Python package that I'm supposed to use. So what? Do we do with this? So like, okay, we're gonna have a new architecture for the site going forward. Whether or not we use Cassandra, it's just a good idea to do that, right? So a little glimpse of what that's gonna be like is a services-oriented architecture. We got the words, web service uh, servers there, all in PHP. Most people, you know, people have said like, why don't you just switch that to Django anyways? Since you're doing stuff, it's like everybody knows PHP at Dig super duper well. Some people know Python. Some of those guys know it super well. Some people like me hate it. So it's just like. Eh, keep it in PHP, that's fine. So we have a new services layer, kind of like, eh, not kind of, I don't want to say it's like the Dynamo paper, but you know, there's a service for specific tasks, right? So we got a story service, that could be, you know, a bunch of different machines that uh, handle story service requests. The user service deals with all that stuff, other services. And then beyond that, uh, you know, we have like whatever data stores we end up using, right? So what happens is the app is just going to make essentially an RPC call over Thrift to the services layer. So if we swap out Cassandra for you know, Dynamo someday, you don't have to change that, right? It works. And the bridge between the web servers and the services layer, um, it's, it, that's thrift as well just because it, eh, it sucks, but it's there. And uh, it's abstracted really, really well. Uh, so we could switch that out, and we're looking at alternatives because we kind of got bitten by it. Uh, a couple times. So that's been our thing. So the services can communicate with each other with like, just right now it's just standard library code. So there's, I wish we would have done them in Java because pooling stuff like DB connections and stuff would have been better that way, but whatever. So the services communicate with each other, they communicate with data stores and they can answer requests to the web stack. So this gives us a way that everything's horizontally scalable, right? The web layer, everyone knows how to horizontally scale that, right? Just get more of those load balance stuff. We could do the same with the services layer, right? So we can just add more user service machines. If people are logging in or signing up faster than we ever thought, or the dig service needs you know, more nodes, you just throw them in there and you're good. And then Cassandra's horizontally scalable, and then we still have MySQL there, which is kind of one of the next things I want to mention. So we got that, but yeah, we still are using MySQL, right? Because it's not the worst thing in the world. It's good at ad hoc queries. Like when you want to say, you know, there's three or four conditions to something. I mean, someone might argue that your business case is too complicated, whatever. But somebody wants to say, get the users that signed up after a certain day and have dug a certain number of stories or something like that, right? So we're not going to be using MySQL for every single thing. There's going to be specific cases that we're going to be using MySQL for just because you can't fit you know, every problem in Cassandra. It's not meant to do everything. I remember Jonathan was over 
trying to help us solve a problem or something. And we came up with these absurd solutions on how you could do it in Cassandra. But it just came down to like, eh, if we put it on MySQL and it doesn't have a billion rows and the entire index fits into memory, turns out we can do the operation in milliseconds. I mean, that's good, right? Like, you want to use the right tool for the right job. I'm not here to say MySQL sucks. I'm just saying you've got to use the right thing to do the right, for the right job, right? So that's kind of where we've come to. So we're going to have some Cassandra, a lot of Cassandra going on, and MySQL is going to be there for various things that need you know, multi-variable uh, queries. So where the user's date is this or that and kind of stuff. Um, but some of what this gives you, as it kind of puts a leash on your product people to a certain extent, right? You're like, you have to plan how your data is going to look. Right, so when you have like a relational database, like even if you don't add indexes, like Oracle will let you query stuff. It'll just be slow, right? So then, you know, product people will be like, well, you have a digs table. Why don't you just get this from it, you know? So it makes you get a little bit more sane with planning out your uh, stuff. So you kind of sort of, I don't want to say this because somebody will fuck it up, but you kind of plan with efficiency in mind. I have this problem to solve. I need to keep secondary indexes with this, that, and the other thing. In a certain place, those secondary indexes need to be sorted in a specific way so I can go ahead and after that do a fetch from some other place to get all that. So it's pretty sane, it's a pretty pragmatic way to do it, but you just don't have the open free world that you did before with using a total SQL uh, solution. So and that's what I was saying, it's just a different mindset. I wish MySQL would just do this, right? Like, there's no generic sharding solution. There's just no way of really doing that. This guy's got a homebrewed thing there. That guy's got a homebrewed thing. There's no, and managing stuff like, oh, you know, if one machine goes down, there's no magic, hey, when it comes back up, all this stuff. That would be nice. What I've seen, I've, I liked FriendFeed's solution, which was kind of sort of almost CouchDB, but in MySQL, kind of, they had their reasons for that. So that was a pretty decent way of doing it. It was kind of like faking MySQL to be a document store, but. It's not the best answer for everything, right? Like, if it just worked, that would be awesome. But the reason people have spent hours and hours and hours of, you know, their smart minds thinking about alternatives is because it just doesn't deal with every problem, right? So that's kind of where we've gotten. And uh, we will use MySQL, but it's going to be for what it's good at as opposed to for everything. So it's not the bucket solution anymore. And that's it. So, and that little guy's drunk. So. Uh, I don't know if we have much time. Let me look at my timer thing. So I've got five minutes for some questions. So if you guys got a couple questions, and if you guys got longer questions or want to talk about data model stuff, we can talk later because that's more than five minutes. And internal questions, ask that guy. Yeah. Well, it's the management that sucks, right? So when you have, so the way we did it sucked spe specially, but I can't. <laughs> it was a special kind of sort of suck, right? But the way we had it, there was, you know, like the last talk said, there was, yeah, they don't like master nodes, right? But we had this master node that you'd say, hey, I'm going to query stuff for user 59. So that's Kevin's user account, which is our generic example. So then that tells you which machines Kevin could be on, right? But then replicate, so being, so Wait, it, yeah, this is in MySQL. So you do that lookup in MySQL, and then essentially you get back a bunch of nodes it could, uh, of it could be on. And then you'd go query those guys, and if one of them failed, you did the other. And then with replication, since it was PHP, which adds a different level of suck, right? You don't have threads that can go do things in the background, right? So you just have to do, do stuff. So when you're doing a write and you're replicating three different ways, right? It's like you start a transaction on this server and that one and that one. One of them fails. You have to roll back all of them. And then what the fuck do you do, right? It's just a pain in the ass. There's no, the management especially suck, it sucks, right? So if you want to move user accounts, the index that would say where user 59 is or whatever, you'd say, hey, he's, uh, on, he, he, he's in timeout for now. Like, come back later. Just, Well, it doesn't solve it completely, right? But like, it does have features that solve a lot of the headaches that we can talk about offline because we have like three minutes left. But at the same time, if we're going to have to write that stuff, and currently our solution was in PHP, right? And MySQL and all the stuff. But then there's a lot of people working on this Cassandra project, right? It just made more sense to get on something that's 
you know, more robust, based in a language that can, you know, do concurrent stuff, right? And there's more minds worrying about it than the guy that has to go fix this other bug tomorrow, right? So getting to, so the community thing is a big deal for various reasons. There's five different people's perspectives on a problem, and the sixth guy had a problem none of you have encountered yet, right? So it's important, if there's this magic MySQL plugin that did sharding and it worked and it was fine, that's a different story, right? But we don't have that, not that I know of. So, anything else? Sweet. All right, thanks, guys.